All right, let's get started. So today is the last lecture, right? We are meeting for the last time. <laughs> so I thought I could as well make it interesting or hopefully interesting. If you feel like you need more practice problems that you need to work on your linear algebra kung fu for the final exam, the best thing to do is to take the textbook, Gilbert Strang's text textbook. It, it goes, the, the chapters pretty much copy what, what we were talking about. But we are not talking about those chapters you of course don't have to worry about. And every chapter has lots of practice problems and solutions. You'll find there are many more practice problems than you will probably care about. <laughs> and they are good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe we'll have some time for more practice problems by the end. I also wanted to tell you that you should please submit your evaluations for me. So, of course, uh, this was my first time doing this course, so I don't expect it was perfect. But please don't tell me just that it sucked, because that's not useful. Tell me how, how it could be improved. <laughs> what can I do better next time? I, some things are pretty obvious. I, some things I learned myself, but how to, how to do it better next time. But maybe you have some other <laughs> ideas. OK. <laughs> well, you've had to fill it by hand, I believe. Yeah, it's like a paper. They hand it out in class and you have to fill it out. Oh. <laughs> so you can track your hand rating. So okay. You have to fill out I did not know that. I thought that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to do it online, right? <laughs> yeah. Eventually, I'm going to go. Yeah. Well, I usually wait until after the exam. It's like, it could be that the exam is. No, 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 no. I think it's a very smart system <laughs> that I can't bribe you with the exam results and the other way around. <laughs> The way it's set up, it's, it's just right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about is today is linear algebra in calculus. Because I realized during during the lectures when I was like going back through the course, I realized and several times I wanted to like point out some connections, but then I didn't want to like the digress. So I figured maybe we can just summarize it now because Linear algebra and calculus have quite a few overlaps. So let's start with the super basics of calculus. This will be like a super, super recap. So derivative of a function, just a scalar function now. So function going from R to R, right? Hey, I haven't really missed that much. So if I have a function like this, I, I think I was drawing it like before, and I, I, I pick some point. Let's say I'm interested in the function <coughs> in the neighborhood of this point. And you know that the derivative basically is the slope of the best fit linear approximation at, at that point, right? That's, that's really just recapitulating. So in a formula, I can write it like this, that f a plus x, where a is my chosen point, I'm for some reason interested about right now, is approximately the value of fa, that's just the value of the function there, plus the derivative if the function in the point a times the x. So there the idea of the x means that a x is a small displacement around a, right? So this means approximately or to first order equal in a small neighborhood of a. You, you should know the standard calculus mantra, right? Well, uh, I'm just re uh, recapitulating here because the point is to go to multivariate functions and vector functions and show you how does it relate to linear algebra. Okay, so let's let's start by introducing a little bit different notation. So instead of this this common notation for a derivative, I can by by definition I can just introduce a slightly different notation. Which will be which will look like this. This delta is like for derivative. Der derivative, a is the point where I'm taking der the derivative, and f is the function I am differentiating. And sometimes I need to put put it in brackets just to make clear it's all together. It's just at, at this point, it's just change of notation. And it's because this notation does not really extend to the multivariate case. That's where we want to go to. Uh, see the connections to linear algebra. So all bo both of these things are what? The derivative as well as this is just like different so what is what is the f as a type? <laughs> so f is a function, right? And if it's if it's evaluated at point A, is it the matrix, the scalar, is the vector? <laughs> 
it's a scalar, yeah. So this, this thing is just, just a scalar. So at this point, there is really no linear algebra unless you consider one by one matrices, especially interesting part of linear algebra. So I, uh, with this notation, let me just write it down with, um, with this new notation. So this is, this is just a new notation for a derivative of a function. Some sort of like differential, differential type notation. By the way, I could also write it in a different way. I could also say that fx, it's, it's really the same idea, just written with a little different variables. I could also write it like this, right? It would still mean the same thing. So all of these equations capture the idea that this linear function is a locally optimal approximation of my original function at point A, where point A is really arbitrary, okay? And you certainly know all the standard standard calculus rules. So what are the standard calculus rules? So if I have a function multiplied by a scalar alpha, so I have function alpha f, I guess I could write it like this, right? What is the what is the derivative? So alpha alpha is real, right? So if I know the derivative of the function f and I just take another function, which is just the same function multiplied by a scalar. Yep. Yeah, you multiply alpha by the derivative. Exactly, so it's alpha times daf, right? This is, this is the der original derivative. This, this, this also says that the derivative is one part of the derivative being a linear operation. The other part of that is if I have two functions, so if I have another function g going also from r to r, then derivative of f plus g is what? Exactly. There. At this point, it's all super simple. But I just figured I would start from the simple things and then go slowly build up to the, to the more complicated things. So slightly trickier is the product, right? But you must know that. So if I take product of these two functions, what's the derivative of the product? That's where calculus starts being calculus. <laughs> It's clear what's happening, right? I have one function, another function. I, I give them both the same argument and multiply it together. So I have a new function, which is just the multiplication. Yep. It's f times the derivative of g plus g times the derivative of f. That's right. I prefer to write it in this uh, order. So derivative of f times g, which, which doesn't really matter, right? Because at this point, everything commutes and so on. Plus f derivative a of g. Yes, exactly. And of course, the golden rule of calculus, the, the, the best one, if I have this function g and I have a function f, then I can, what I can, what I can do is take a function h, which is f composed with g. Do you know this notation of comp composing functions? Which means really nothing but that h of x is f of g of x, right? And then the best rule of calculus, the chain rule, says that the differential of the composed function h, or I could also write differential of f composed with g, right, is what? And here, here you need to be a little bit careful, right? Can you tell me what that is? So I guess it's easier to do it here, right? If so, if I want to write the derivative of h, then what should I put there? So I need to first differentiate f at the point gx and then multiply it with the derivative of g at the point x. That's, that's the chain rule, right? So if I write it in this notation and at point a, that means that I have to do differential at point g a of my function f multiplied, and it's just a scalar multiplication with differential of my function g at point a. And this this empty operation is scalar multiplication. That's that's the chain rule, right? So this is this is all simple. This is all for scalar functions, right? And the whole point I want to make today is how to go to multivariate and vector functions. So let's start let's start with multivariate functions.
there are some nice connections to linear algebra start beginning to appear. So by multivariate, I mean that f now goes from r to n to r. So the function consumes a vector and produces a scalar and can be a completely arbitrary function, doesn't have to be linear. In linear algebra, we're always, always talking about linear functions. In calculus, can be any function. I mean, not completely any. If you want to differentiate it, you need to assume like smoothness and so on. And that's what calculus is all about, basically, to establishing the conditions under which all these uh, things are true. So if it was, for example, from R2 to R, then you know we have the intuition of a height field, right? Like um, if I'm at a plane, I could like imagine here is some like mountain range or something like that. And if it's smooth, then this is what my function describes, essentially, right? Have you, did you have that? Did you have multivariate calculus yet? Okay, good. So <clears throat> let's see if you remember how the local linear, linear approximation works in the multivariate case. So here I am taking again a small display. So I'm interested in point A and I'm taking a small displacement X. So X is some small vector, meaning that the norm of X is small. And I can write it like this. So again, that's the value of the function at point A. That's a scalar, right? Plus, and what, what happens here? That's, that's, that's the interesting part, right? So can you tell me what is it just by words? <laughs> Like the idea of this is to just translate myself to the function, right? <laughs> I don't want to take the approximation at zero because then I would be very far off the actual function, right? So like first I have to take a look what the actual value is there, right? That's like, that would be like the zero order approximation, right? If I want first order, then I need to look about how, uh, or look into how the function linearly changes as I, as I move around the small neighborhood of A, right? So this is this is a constant. Okay, and it will, yeah. Mm. So you need to find the gradient, okay. and so and use that sort of in place of the first derivative you're using. Answer. Correct. Yeah, that there, there there is a gradient, but just on the ideological <laughs> um, level, it's a linear function. What happens there, right? right? So what I can write, if I, if I want to keep the same notation, I can do this. And this is, this is really just the gradient, as just as you said. And here is a dot product with my x. So this little dot is my dot product. But what this means, this means a linear function from r to n to r, right? So this is really nothing but function from rn to r, which is linear, right? That also means that I can write the function as sum of some, some scalar coefficients alpha i and xi, where x, x are my variables, that x is this x, and alphas are some coefficients, right? That's, that's what a linear function is, as, as simple as that. And these, these coefficients are exactly components of the gradient, that's what I wrote here as the delta A F. And what does it describe is the locally best fit plane, right? So you can imagine this picture generalized to a height field, right? So if I have some sort of mountain range here, then I have lo locally best fit plane. It's just like I put some plane at, at my point, right? So here somewhere is my point. And I find the plane that locally best approximates the function around A. Okay, and that, that's what this thing is. <coughs> so the linear, the linear part, the, the, the gradient is really specified just by one vector, right? This, this vector. I could also write it in a slightly different notation. And I think really the notation here is everything. If you want to be computing derivatives and not get lost in it. The dot product I could also write like this, right? Oh, by the way, I give it a little arrow to just make it clear that this is a vector as opposed to a number. And there is tons of different notations for, for the gradient, right? I think I was even previously using just the gradient of f. Sometimes you can just put like at which point the gradient is computed because this is important. At every point, the gradient will be different, 
right? The gradient or differential, it can also be called total differential or total derivative. It has like lots of names, but only one meaning always. It's locally optimal approximation to the function. And uh, here, linear approximation. So optimal linear approximation at a small neighborhood of A. Okay, so how do we compute this? It's, it's a vector, right? So what, what exactly are its components? Again, you could probably tell me that. <laughs> So it's a n by one vector, right? Because it was an n-dimensional function. And if I have the function, how do I compute the gradient? Th this being the gradient. I take the thing that's called partial derivative, right? With respect to all the, all the coordinates. So the first um, one will be partial derivative with respect to x1 at my point A and so on up to partial derivative with respect to x n, that's the last coordinate there. So this is an n by one vector, vector of partial derivatives. And here comes the first connection to linear algebra, actually to the very, very first things we started with. So what is the geometric interpretation of the gradient? So I defined the gradient like this, right? I said that from the calculus perspective, it's the optimal local linear approximation of my function, the best fit plane or hyperplane. And what does it what does this vector mean geometrically? I think I yeah, I know I know I even mentioned it during one lecture and I said, huh, maybe I should explain why that is true and I but I didn't have the time back then. So it's like Let's explain it now. So I, I think I said before that the gradient, that this vector is the direction of steepest ascent of that function, right? So why is that true? So, and you can consider this as a practice problem. So let's, let's, let's do, a, let's do a, like a side problem like this. If I have, assume I have a linear function. So let's say that maybe I should call it differently, right? Let's call it phi. So it's a linear function which is computed as, which is or defined as ptx, right? So really just pi, xi, phi is a linear function from rn to r, right? So of course, if the vector b is zero, then the function is really boring, then it's just zero everywhere. Nothing interesting is happening. So, but let's assume that b is non-zero. In this case, I can ask myself, forget forget for a second about all the calculus, just, just for this linear function, what is the direction of steepest ascent? You, could con you can consider this uh, like a practice problem too. It would be a nice little final exam problem. <laughs> so I'm, I gave you a linear function, so I know it passes through zero, right? That's all, all good linear functions have to do. I told you that B is non-zero because if B was zero, it's a really, really stupid function. <laughs> and I'm asking, what is the direction of steepest ascent? So what do I mean by direction? I want to find vector D such that the norm of D is one, right? Then looking for direction, I, I should not, it doesn't matter how long the vector is, so I can just say let's, let's length, it's length one because it's linear function doesn't really matter. And I want to find the D so that if I move uh, such that phi D will be as much as possible. I guess you could also cast it as a variational problem if you like <laughs> remember the previous lectures. But at this point, the solution is fairly simple. The solution is to simply look at, so I'm looking for my D and what, what I want to maximize is the this, this dot product, right? Subject to, so maybe I can just write maximize this, subject to D being norm one, right? I didn't really write it nicely, but I hope you can see clearly. <coughs> Any ideas how to maximize that? Yep. B 
B equal to X. You meant the, wait, did you say B or D? <laughs> well, X is the variable, right? So, and B, B is given to me. And I'm looking for D. That's right. Um, almost, except that I wanted the nor normal D, right? Unit D. So yeah, so let, let, me, let me explain uh, for everybody why, why this is true. That's because that this is a dot product, right? I guess I could also write it like B dot D, right? So you know, I guess it was like the last, the first lecture or second lecture or something like this. This is by the dot product formula, oh sorry, this is D, times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, right? Mm -hmm. I said that the length of D is one, right? So this is just the length of B times the cosine of the angle, which is of course at most B, right? Because cosine of alpha will never be greater than one, right? Cosine of alpha is always less than or equal than one, right? And it happens to be exactly equal and when, sorry, when cosine alpha happens to be exactly equal one, then I have exactly the equality there, right? So that's, that's the maximum. So if, let me write it down. If cosine alpha is exactly one, then it means that my B T D is exactly the norm of B and that's the maximum because it cannot possibly go above that, right? And if the cosine of alpha is one, then I achieve that maximum value there. So from this, I can of course, so this, uh, uh, when is the cosine of alpha equal one? Well, that's exactly just as you said correctly. That's when my D will be a scalar multiple of B where alpha is some scalar and the, the scalar must be such that d is length one so that means that the alpha must be one over the length of b so this is this is the the solution this is the direction of steepest descent of my linear function so what does it mean for is that, is that clear actually let's yeah, I will show an example. So what does it mean? How does it connect to calculus in, in a beautiful way, right? If, if this is the locally optimal linear approximation of my function f, then no matter how complicated the function f was, locally, the gradient is the direction of the steep of steepest ascent, right? Because locally, it all that matters is this linear part and this linear part grows the most in the direction of the B, which in this case is the gradient. Okay. If it's uh, so, let's I can show it on an example. Uh, sim let's let's take a look at a simple example. Simple example is function f x y equals x plus y. Right, it's a function going from R to to R. What is what is the gradient at? Doesn't really matter because it is linear function already, right? But let's say it's zero. Tell me somebody tell me the gradient. That means I need to take partial derivative with respect to x and then partial derivative with respect to y, right? If I'm taking partial derivative with respect to x, then the y doesn't matter because it's considered to be constant. So that's one. If I'm taking partial derivative with respect to y, it's the same thing, it's also one. Right, so the gradient doesn't even matter where I take it because it's a linear function. The gradient is the same everywhere. And let's if if I let like if you like imagine the the graph of the function. Let's say I was talking about the height field. Here is my x-axis. Here is the y-axis. How does the graph of the function look like? Do you have the geometric intuition? It's a flat plane, right? And it's a it's a plane like this. It starts here, here it intersects my paper. Here is the zero, right? And then it grows up like this. Do you see the animation? <laughs> Maybe here you can like 
take advantage of the fact that you see it in 3D as opposed to the people watching it on YouTube who will only see it in 2D. So here we're like, it grows, it grows up like this. And that's what the gradient tells us, right? The gradient is the vector one, one. I should, I should probably normalize it, but doesn't really matter. What matters is the direction. And this is the direction, right? So this is indeed the direction of the steepest ascent of that function. And this, this, this is essentially like one, one example of connection between linear al algebra and calculus. There is more to it. Oh, by the way, for um, multivariate functions like f, like this, and g, like this, I can also uh, define the standard calculus rules, right? I can say that my gradient of function alpha f, where alpha is a scalar, is again just the scalar times the gradient of the original function. And that's what's one of the rules now expressed for gradients. Now, if I take the gradient of functions f plus g, it's again really unsurprising, is the gradient of f plus the gradient of g, right? And if I want the gradient of the product of the two functions, then what do I do? I get gradient of the first function times g plus f times the gradient of the second function or differential whatever you want to call it the one thing that's good to notice here that this has this is n by one vector and this is just a scalar all right the function evaluated at that point i guess i could also write like ga because that's a at a, at a, at a point a Actually, if you compare, and th this is why I like this, this delta notation as a differential, if you compare it to these rules, it's e exactly the same, except that now the delta, except that the types are different, right? So if you like think about it from a programming perspective and you like overloaded functions, then this sort of makes more sense, just the types differ, but like the idea behind it stays the same. Okay, so we are not, the, the best is yet to come, and that's vector functions. I don't know how was your calculus class. When we had calculus, I was, I was scared of this because there was always like a tons of indices and became like really messy really quickly. <laughs> the chain rule was like a nightmare to like remember how, how does, what, what, what like gets multiplied with what and what does it get summed with what. <laughs> like a double sum sort of thing <coughs> but if you realize there is very direct connection to linear algebra which makes not only remembering but also using the chain rule for vector functions very easy so why do we study functions like this going from rn to rm like typically could be like r3 to r3 which can be describing like velocity field in space when we'll be doing fluid simulation that's that's what will come up. Deformation field, another example, right? So for every point in space or every vector in space, we assign it a vector, right? Could also look at the vector function as a collection of functions f1 to fm, where all the individual functions are from rn to r, where i goes from 1 to n, of course. Now the fun thing happens, fun if once we again, so again we wanna do the locally linear approximation of f at a point a and a small displacement x away from the point a. So when the x is small, we can write this approximation. So here I'm putting the arrow here too, just to make it clear that the value of f is a vector, not just the argument of f is a vector, it was already before, but now also the, the result of f is a vector. So f consumes a vector and produces another vector, right? So do you know what is, what is going to be here? So again, qualitatively, it's going to be again a, a linear mapping, right? 
What well, actually can you tell me what will be the type of that linear map? Linear transformation there? Here is gonna be the locally optimal linear approximation of this function, right? So if it's a function from Rn to Rm, then the locally optimal linear approximation is going to be also a function from Rn to Rm, but this time linear. Linearized around A, right? That's, that's really all this differential business means, linearized around some point. Here we are linearizing like a pretty interesting function going from one vector space to another vector space. But it's just a linear function from Rn to Rm. Right. So all that happens here, I can I can again write it in the same way. So as, as a differential times my x and what the types are. So the type of this is m by one vector, right? Because it goes to r to m, right? So of course this must be also m by one vector. And then what is this thing? So x obviously is n by one vector, right? Because the function goes from r to n. So I need to give it n numbers so it can, so I can call it. <laughs> and what is, what is the differential in this case? Huh? N. It's a matrix, yeah, it's n by n matrix. This really no, no other type would make sense there, right? I, I need to sum vectors of the same dimension. So must be M by N matrix, right? This matrix is what's often called the Jacobian. Sometimes some people also call it gradient, but that's a little more confusing. Uh, what does it, so what exactly is in this matrix? So it's an M by N matrix. And it's a matrix, you can look at it as a matrix that stacks the individual gradients. So if we look at this, if I split the function into the components f1 to fm, and this is the gradient of f1 transpose because it's a row vector up to the gradient of function fm, because I have m of these functions, again transpose because those are like rows. So those are the rows of my matrix, right? Like if you haven't seen the connection to linear algebra before, well here it's really like striking, right? So I could write it also like individual components, right? And the individual components are going to be individual partial derivatives. So here I am working on F1. So it's the partial of F1 by X1. Here it's still uh, F1, but now it's the partial by Xn. Then it would be F2 and so on out after I get to Fm by X1. And finally, I get to partial of Fm by Xn at point A. And this is really nothing but an M by N matrix because the partial derivative, that's something I can evaluate at, at, at a given point, right? And then just, this just becomes a matrix of numbers. And the meaning of the matrix is, it's again, the best locally optimal linear approximation of the function F at the small neighborhood of point A. And now the, yeah. Well, how do you define like a um, like a local approximation for a point in like yeah space? yeah <laughs> yeah I know what you mean. Um, in calculus, you can go like really nerdy about it and talk about metric spaces and stuff like this. But all all you really need to do is capture the notion that like if you are at a point, if I'm like here, if this is my two D space, right? And this is my point A, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. There was like some vector connected to or origin, whatever, right? But the point is that you need to define some small neighborhood around, around it. So you could say, for example, that the small neighborhood is the set of points X such that the norm of A minus X is below some epsilon, right? Like, like ball around, epsilon ball around A. 
and this is in some metric that's why that's why that's where we can get all nerdy and talk about metric spaces but that's that's like that's, th those are the nuances of calculus what you really need to remember for computing your derivatives and so on that just means being close to a this intuitive notion i think is all you need is that what you are wondering about uh sort of <laughs> Well, if, if it's a function from R2 to R, right, that's also this case, M, M is one, right? If it was to, that doesn't matter to what it goes, right? Because here you are asking about the argument of the function, right? And you were asking about how, how do we know that we are close to A or? Um, no, um, so you know how like when we take it, In this case, none, none that I know of. <laughs> in this case, you have some intuition, right? Because here you can think of the, the partial with respect to x like this slope and the partial with respect to y at this slope, right? And that gives, that gives you the best fit plane. Here, the intuition is a little bit more confused. I guess you could, the best intuition you can do is probably just by splitting into the components and then thinking about every single component individually. <laughs> but yeah, it's not, not as beautiful as like thinking about the whole thing at the same time. Well, what you usually need to do in, in applications is to be able to compute derivatives of things, right? Like in phys physics-based uh, animation or physics-based anything, you often need to be computing forces and forces are derivatives of a potential energy, right? And quite often the potential energies are like energies from pretty high dimensions. So uh, that's where you really need to just compute the derivatives, derive what is going on. And your strongest weapon in doing so will be the chain rule for the multivariate case. So how does the chain rule work with these multivariate functions? So let's first do the simpler case. Let's first do this case where f goes from Rn to R and g will be a function going from rm to rn and i decide to take a function h which which does this which takes f of g of x which means that h is really just a composition of f and g and h then goes from r to m to r right and what I'm really interested in is what is the differential at point A of my function H. So this is really the multivariate chain rule. I don't know, did you have this in calculus? And if, and if yes, how, how, is what, how it was explained? Because in my classes of calculus, I took like 10 years ago, by more than that. It was explained in such a way that I could not possibly remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a very good teacher, by the way. He was a really good mathematician. We did explain that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, it's actually super simple. It's really, really the same format as, where was that? That's the scalar case, right? So let me write it down. So what I need to do is to take the differential of function f at point g a. This is another gradient. And then multiply it. And we will talk about that multiplication in a second. With the differential or Jacobian of my function g. So we need to uh, 
make sense of the types here, what is going on here. So h is a function from rm to r. So the differential, after I transpose it, is going to be 1 by m vector, right? f is a function going from rm to r. So its differential at point ga is going to be 1 times n vector. Why it has to be ga, right? Because how h works, it, it, it consumes an m vector x, then it maps it to an n vector g of x, and then finally applies f on that, right? So it wouldn't really make sense to be evaluating f in anything else. I, I need to be evaluating f in an n-dimensional vector, right? And that's what g produces. So this, this really makes sense already from the type standpoint. And what is this thing? Um, do, do, do. Yeah. Again, from the types, you can like immediately derive it just by doing a type check, right? It has to be n by m, right? So that this, this equation actually makes sense. And this this operation here is, is what? This operation here is just vector matrix multiplication. Or I can do it like here. Vector times matrix multiplication. So this is a row vector that stacks all the partial derivatives of f f. This, this differential g, this is a matrix like this, except of slightly different dimensions and of g, but it's a matrix that stacks all the partial derivatives. And the differential of the composed function h is just a ma vector matrix product of the two differentials. It's as simple as that. The problem with the with like the formulation I had in my calculus, I don't know what formulation did you have. There they basically wrote out this vector matrix product. So it's so like you have to like worry about indexes and so on. And it's much more difficult to remember and use. And it gets even better if you think about chain rule for vector functions. So this is still chain rule, but now I will take function f going from rn to r p, not just r1, and g will still be going from rn to rn, and I decide to construct the function h, which is again, so h is now going to be, and they are now all vector functions, so h is a vector function of f, g, x, Every, everything is vectors now. That's the most general case. And the function h goes from rm to rp, of course. Right? And the question obviously is what is the differential of the composed function h at some point a? And the answer is that the differential is nothing but the differential of function f at g a times the differential of function g at the point a. So let's look at the types. So the differential of h, h is a function going from rm to rp. So this is a p by m matrix, right? Because it consumes an m vector, produces a p vector. f is the same way. It's going to be p times n. And g is going to be n times m, right? So again, this is nothing but a matrix matrix multiplication. And that th this rule contains all the chain rules we discussed previously, right? If you plug there the fun if n equals p equals m and they are all one, then you have just the scalar chain rule. If the p is one, then you have this previous chain rule, right? You can also look at it. At, this is basically applying the chain rule to every single gradient, every single row of this matrix individually.
And if you think about it, it all makes sense because what we, what we are doing here, what these differentials mean are uh, linear approximations of these functions at some point, right? And remember that we discussed that the composition of linear transformations corresponds to matrix multiplication, right? With respect to a chosen basis. Sometimes there is like this, this little nuance that um, a linear transformation is represented by a matrix only with respect to a chosen basis, but once you have chosen the basis, you're fine. Okay. So this is all I wanted to tell you now on the relationship between calculus and linear algebra. You might, it will not be needed for the final exam or anything, but you might find it useful later <laughs> in your career. <laughs> When you need, when you, when it happens to you, and you will be doing engineering, I almost guarantee it will happen to you. They will need to compute derivatives of some complex functions. So then, then, then remember <laughs> of these rules and how do they connect to matrices? And a good advice is stay in the matrix world as long as you can, because once you start going to in indices, then it becomes like indexing nightmare, and and you have to worry about summations and so on, and the notation just gets so much more messy. <laughs> Okay, so we still have a little bit of time, unless you have some questions on this. Of course, I didn't do any proofs or anything like that. You could like spend a semester worth of calculus just on this. But this is all you need to remember if, if you wanna use it. Okay, so let me do um, at least one more practice problem, which I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just clarify some things about the matrix exponential. So switching gears completely. Here is a practice problem. How is defined matrix exponential for A n by n? And what is its inverse? Inverse n square. I think I might have forgot to mention one important property here, which might be useful in the final. So let me say that. So how is defined the exponential of the matrix? We had that a couple lectures ago, right? Using Taylor series for a matrix, right? So the definition looked like this. Start with identity. Then I give it a, then I give it a squared divided by two factorial plus a cubed divided by three factorial and so on. Right, remember that? Now here is one interesting property that might be useful. If a and b commute, if a, b happens to be b, a, that's very of often not the case, right? But sometimes it might be the case. When, when, it's, when it's the case, for example, where the two matrices commute, give me some example. So you're doing practice stuff. Like for example, the stupid example when they are both identity, right? <laughs> but they could also be identity times a scalar, right? Or when it's the same matrix, where A equals B. Right. There are some cases when this actually is true. So when this is true, then it's also true that the exponential of A times the exponential of B is equal to the exponential of A plus B. I don't have much time, so I will not explain why. You could try, like, if you wanted to verify this, you could try multiplying these infinite series together and basically compare the left hand side and right hand side. What you really need there is that you can write AB as BA, which means that then you will come up with like with like this, then you can just write it as two AB. That's what makes these th two things equal. And once I have this, I can figure out what is the inverse of the exponential, right? Do you have some idea? Practice problem for you? Again, I also took it from the Gilbert Strengths textbook. So if you want to take some more <laughs> practice problems, that's a good resource. So let's try to use this property here, right? For some well-chosen matrices. 
Okay, we don't have much time, right? Uh, so I will just show you how it's done. So if I take a and minus a, right? If I take a and minus a, then these clearly commute, right? Doesn't matter if I multiply minus a with a or a with minus a. So that means that a e to a times e to minus a is equal to e to a minus a. But what is a minus a? Well, that's a zero matrix, right? Matrix with all zeros. Matrix of all zeros is a very special example of a diagonal matrix. It's like that it has zeros on the diagonal. And you know that you can compute exponential of a diagonal matrix just by exponentiating the diagonal terms, right? So this is identity, right? Which means that the inverse of a to a is exactly a, the exponential of minus a. And what is the square? of this that's I think even even easier that's e times a times exponential of a times exponential of a again a commutes with a so this is a plus a so this is exponential of 2a okay so let review the rules for the exponential my suggestion is Take the practice problems from the textbook uh, of the topic you are, which is your least favorite one, <laughs> and do some practice problems on that. Okay, so this is it. I will be still in touch with you, or email, or Piazza, or so if you need something. Other than that, I wish you good luck, and <laughs> please do the evaluation for me, and don't be too mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.